Hello, everyone. Yet yeah, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is Nick and Peter from the Guilt Grace Gratitude podcast. We have a special guest today, and this is season three promises and fulfillments. And what we're doing is we're going through the Covenant Theology book by Crossway. It's Covenant Theology, Biblical, the- Theological, and Historical Perspective. And we're doing chapter three. So this is episode three, chapter three, covenant of works in the New Testament. And it's the author of it, of this chapter is Dr. Guy Waters. And we are having Dr. Guy Waters on this on this episode. But real quick, just as a reminder, after the show, go to our show notes, check out the Society, Society of Reformed Podcasters for other podcasts out there, Nate Park Churches to find a Reformed Church near you, and a link to the book Crossway donated to us for this whole season. So you can find a link to that book. You could purchase a copy for yourself so you can follow along with us. So without further ado, I'll let Peter further introduce Dr. Waters. Yeah, if you guys listen to season two, you'll remember him from our episode on covenant theology towards the beginning of that season so we're super excited to have dr waters on again he's a professor of new testament over there been teaching for a little over 10 years but thanks for coming on speaking about this chapter maybe just a little bit of a an uh, an edit the rts faculty wrote the covenant theology and and crossway published it um so thankful for rts the, the whole faculty there for writing this really comprehensive book that I don't think has really been done before. We were talking pre-show about this, but thanks, Dr. Waters, for coming on again. Peter, Nick, thank you for having me back. I'm excited to be with you. Thank you. We, we yeah. always joke with our other guests. We're not, we're not terribly sure yet if it's, a, if it's a good thing or a bad thing to come back on our show, if, if, you, have, if you haven't risen up the ranks past our show, but we're, we're still thankful nonetheless. Well, thank you. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I, um, yesterday I actually re-listened to that episode we had with you, season two, Covenant Theology. It's really good as a primer for this conversation, Yeah, just to, for the audience too, if you want to re-listen to that. And actually at the end, when we talk about other things you got working on, you're talking about this book. And uh, oh. we didn't know at that time we would be doing what we're doing now. So this is exciting. And um, we could just jump in and and talk about this chapter. So let me just kind of hand it off to you uh, to just kind of open it up, explain to the audience the the um, the meaning of this chapter and what it's all about. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. So this chapter looks at the covenant of works as it appears in the New Testament. My colleague in Charlotte, Dick Belcher looks at the covenant of works as it appears in the Old Testament. And the book is following at this point in the sequence of chapters, the the progression of covenants in redemptive history, covenant of works, covenant of grace, and the various administrations within the covenant of grace. So that's that's where this falls in the the mapping of the chapters of the book. And, The word covenant doesn't really show up much in the New Testament, certainly not nearly as much as the Old Testament, but it would be wrong to conclude that the New Testament is not as concerned about covenant as the Old Testament is concerned about covenant. And that is doubly true for the covenant of works. Uh, There are some pivotal passages in particularly the writings of Paul, that address the covenant of works in relation to the ministry of Christ. And that gives us then the framework, not just for understanding the the history of God's dealings with humanity, uh, creation, fall, redemption, consummation, but it gives us an eye on the person and work of Christ. It helps us to understand what he has done to save sinners. And the more we appreciate that covenantal framework to Christ's redemptive work, the better we understand the gospel, the better we can live the Christian life in the here and now. 
that's that's helpful and maybe maybe even a kind of a background question to this too you kind of talk about at the beginning of the chapter i think your average person and even average christian look at the old testament and say oh that's the works that's the law the new testament's just grace just christ <clears throat> can you speak to that question and and why it's important to see the covenant of works in the new testament specifically and we can say not just in the old testament right so the covenant of works for listeners who may not be familiar with the term or the idea says that in the garden in Genesis chapter 2, uh, God came to Adam, and Adam, of course, was created in the image of God. He was obedient from the moment of his creation, was walking in fellowship with God from the beginning, and God came to Adam and said to Adam in so many words, Adam, if you continue in obedience to me, then you will enter into confirmed life, uh, the life of blessed fellowship and communion with me. And not just you, Adam, but I, I'm appointing you as a representative of all the people who are going to descend from you. Uh, so he, he is standing there as representative of, of the human race for ordinary people like you and me. And, and God said to Adam, now, I want you to keep obeying me, doing all the things you've been doing, and I also want you to refrain from eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God says, on the day you eat of it, you will surely die. So there's, there's the threat, death. If, if Adam had obeyed, life would have been the result. Of course, we know the outcome. Adam sinned, fell into disobedience. We fell in and with Adam. And with sin has come all its misery in, in its wake, sin and death. And of course, this is a point that Paul is going to underscore in Romans chapter five. We, we can talk about that a little bit later. So th that's at the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter two. Now, straight away, God pursues Adam in Genesis three and, and Eve, and that is a pursuit of mercy. And there we have in Genesis 3.15, the very first promise of gospel mercy to sinners. Mm -hmm. And that is the seed out of which the remainder of the Bible will, will blossom and grow. So that, that gospel promise, which appears in seed, grows, blooms into this fruitful tree as we make our way through the Old Testament and into the New Testament until it comes to its appointed goal, and that is the person and work of Christ. So the whole of the Old Testament is God preparing the world, preparing the way for the coming of Christ in the fullness of time, Paul puts it, and God begins right then and there saving sinners through the coming work of Jesus Christ. And so God has a people who are trusting in him, who are looking to that promised Messiah, who, who receive the forgiveness of sins, who receive grace to live uh, a life that's, that's pleasing to God, who, who are enjoying the benefits of the gospel as we enjoy the benefits of the gospel. All of that is taking place from Genesis 3.15 and forward. So the Old Testament and the New Testament are with one voice pointing to the person and work of Christ, God has his people scattered uh, throughout both testaments who are trusting in Christ for salvation, just as we. So we really need to, to put in the trash can this idea mm. that Old Testament is pure law and judgment, New Testament mm. is pure grace and mercy, and never the twain shall meet. The covenant of works helps us to understand what both testaments are about and how they complement each other, and the point of integration is Christ. Hmm. Yeah, getting flashbacks to season two right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I, I think <clears throat> what I'd like to do is, is repeat what I feel like I'm hearing so the, the audience can know that they're on the same page. Because if I'm not on the same page, they might not be either. But um, so pre-fall, Adam was in good 
perfect union with um, with God and the covenant of works he was able to achieve. But once he fell to sin, uh, that that perfect union with God has been tarnished and it's impossible for uh, as is, it was impossible for Adam to fulfill that covenant of works. Uh, now that was post fall. And because we are descendants of Adam, he is our representative. We are under that same curse. We are, we are in Adam when we uh, are outside of Christ. You know, we are in that covenant of works by being in Adam. And then through Christ, because he's God, was able to be the only one to fulfill perfect obedience under the covenant of works on our behalf as our representative. And so we're either, and, and Jesus is not in Adam, he's of Adam. I think you mentioned that in the chapter, which is helpful. So for us, we're either in Adam or we're in Christ, but we're all born in Adam first. That, that's well put, Nick. That's right. So, and this is where Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 are so important. Yeah. For all the differences among human beings there's really one basic difference that matters. You are either in Adam or you are in Christ. We are, we come into this world conceived and born in Adam. And that means we are guilty of Adam's first sin. We inherit from him a corrupt nature. So we are born sinners. We are by nature sinners. And we do what Adam did in the garden after he sinned. Adam tried to cover himself with rags of his own making, and Adam tried to run away from God. And that's all that we would do left to ourselves. Christ, however, is not, when he comes into this world, he is not in the position that you and I are in because he doesn't have a He's not born of a mom and dad like you and I are. He, he is conceived of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary of her humanity. And so he is, as you put it, he is not in Adam, but he is of Adam. So he's a true human being, but a humanity united to deity. So he is qualified and willing to be the savior of, of sinners. And so Christ steps in to do the two things that we need. We need obedience because just because we sin doesn't mean God's requirement disappears. That requirement is still there. And that's what Jesus fulfills by a life of obedience. And justice has to be satisfied. We have sinned. Sin carries the death penalty, the penalty of eternal death. That has to be paid. And Christ pays that penalty on the cross. So the gospel as we see it especially in Romans 5, tells us that all of our covenant of works obligations are met by the last Adam, Jesus Christ. And that's why when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we know that we stand righteous, we're counted righteous, no longer condemned, and that life is ours, not because we've earned it, but because it has been gifted to us by the one who did earn it, Jesus Christ. We are no longer in Adam, we are in Christ. And that becomes then the starting point for the way that we look at the whole of our Christian life. And as you read the letters of Paul, that phrase, in Christ, some 200 times, it is coming right out of this covenant of works, covenant of grace framework, that is crystallized in Romans 5, as well as in 1 Corinthians 15. That, that actually brings me to kind of kind of diving deeper into those two texts too. So mm -hmm. within 1 Corinthians, you bring out a couple of things. <clears throat> and one of, a, one of the big things I thought, which I wasn't expecting this coming in, was you talked about resurrection mm -hmm. and how this relates to covenant works. So can you describe how, because I, I don't think people generally make that connection between resurrection and covenant works. So can you describe that connection for the listeners, why that's so crucial? And you talk about Dr. Gaffin, a couple other things. Uh, so dive in deeper into the text with those two things. Right. So remember 
going back to our, our framework, covenant of works framework, what, what was the promise that God held out to Adam? It was life, mm -hmm. not mere biological life, because Adam was living and breathing. He was alive and well in the garden. This, this is the life of eternal, consummate, confirmed fellowship and communion with God. And that's what Adam forfeited when he disobeyed. And in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells us that at the resurrection, Christ entered into this life for us. He secured this life, the life that was held out to Adam in the creation. And if, if you look at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, you'll see that Paul quotes Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and says, look, this points to Jesus Christ. And uh, the last Adam became life-giving spirit. And so the gift of the Holy Spirit is the down payment on this consummate life that has been gifted to us, won for us by Christ in the gospel. And because Christ was raised from the dead, we have every assurance that that life is ours and will never be taken away, we'll never lose it. We have begun to experience this life now. We will fully experience this life at the resurrection. So there's, there's a now and a not yet, and there's a sense in which the best is yet to come. There, we, we get a taste, a foretaste of this life in the here and now through the ministry of the spirit, but its fullness awaits the resurrection. And, and that's why Paul is always directing us to the future. He is always directing us forward to the return of Christ and to the, the promises that will come to complete fulfillment at Christ's return. Uh, Paul is he, he's an optimist in that sense be, because of, of what Christ has accomplished. So everything hinges in 1 Corinthians 15 on the resurrection. Would it be... Would it be fair to say, uh, maybe condensing this with the resurrection, that the resurrection is, in a sense, the confirmation that Christ did what the law demanded, which is why his resurrection is also our resurrection if we share in him. Mm -hmm. Is that right? It, absolutely, yes. So uh, when Christ rose from the dead, uh, when he stepped out of the tomb, that was a, a public testimony that he had finished what he had set out to do. And it was the father's public approval, approbation of his son when he raised him from the dead, that Christ had done all that sinners like us need uh, per the covenant of works. So that angle, we, we shouldn't short sell that. that that's critical. So it, there, there is a a declaration even as there is an accomplishment in the resurrection uh, both of those give us a, a firm place to stand in the christian life and <clears throat> christ is uh, commonly called the second adam and as our representative we he had the resurrection first and then we can know that our hope is in our resurrection because he did it first as as our representative just as outside of christ our representative would be adam and we would fall to sin because adam fell to sin that's right we're united to christ and that means everything that belongs to christ is ours and so he has been raised gloriously from the dead we share in that resurrection Christ's death, we share in that death as well. And really the whole of the Christian life comes out of that. But his death and his resurrection have that framework within the covenant of works. Christ, as you, you rightly say, Nick, is the, the second man, the last Adam. So you, you have to understand Christ, his death, his resurrection in light of Adam, what he should have done and what he failed to do. Yeah. And then um, the next 
passage that you move into in the chapter with Romans 5, and you say Paul's rebuilding, but he's also kind of nuancing his understanding of the covenant of works and how Christ accomplishes. So how, how exactly is Paul nuancing his argument from 1 Corinthians 15 and Romans 5? Yeah, great question. So 1 Corinthians 15 really focuses on the resurrection and what Christ achieved in the resurrection. And the way Paul builds on that in Romans 5, his, his focus is not really on the resurrection. He's looking more at the death of Christ in Romans 5. That's one difference. A second difference is that in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says very simply, in Adam all die, in Christ all shall be made alive. But he, he doesn't really talk about the how. Well, what was it about how did Adam's sin and death break into my life? And, and that's what Paul addresses in Romans 5. And that's where he, he explains both union and imputation, that Adam's sin is counted to us, reckoned to us, so that in the courtroom of God, we stand guilty of that sin, uh, as Adam stood guilty of that sin. And Paul goes on to say, now look at Christ. His righteousness is imputed to the sinner who believes, such that he is counted righteous as Christ is counted righteous in the courtroom of God. So Paul is helping us to understand what's going on in that relationship between uh, a person in Adam, a person in Christ, such that, that they would uh, stand guilty or stand righteous before God. Mm. And also want hopefully you to stress the fact of the, the gift of grace, that it's something that we didn't work to achieve. And I think that's something that a lot of us need reminder is that we get the covenant of works. So a lot of people think that they need to do something to earn God's favor, but really could you stress the fact and you write, you do talk about it and touch about it in the chapters, like what, what is there that we need to do um, to actually get justification? What it is that we bring to the table that would make, God want to save us? You know, it's kind of a rhetorical, open-ended question. I'll let you go and go with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's critical. Paul calls this righteousness the free gift of righteousness in Romans 5. So gift means gift. We, we don't earn it. We don't qualify for it. Uh, it's not contingent on, on good behavior going forward. It, it is a gift. And so it's unearned in every sense of the word by us, but it's not unearned because Christ mm -hmm. earned it for us. And understanding that Christ earned that gift helps us to see that it has to be a free gift to us. It's been earned. Justice has been answered. God's demands of law have been satisfied, but we don't do the satisfying. Christ does that. And so it is to us a free gift. Well, someone says, well, don't I have to believe? Well, yes, you do have to believe. But even faith is the free gift of God. It is part of the gift of God in Jesus Christ. And there is no merit or credit to me in believing. If I believe, that is just evidence that God's grace has already taken hold of my life. And so there's no credit to me, all credit and glory goes to Christ. Wow, and thank you for underlining that part. And something that really popped out to me in this is that's, that's justification right there. Mm -hmm. And then your, your natural response should be gratitude, which, you know, that's the, our show called Grace Gratitude. So it walks it through, but natural response to realizing that free gift of grace 
would be pure gratitude. So it's almost like in a weird way, the law or covenant of works or just works would be something we work out in gratitude, mm -hmm. but not something that we need to save us because we've already been saved. Yeah, a, a lot of Christians, I think, look at the Christian life along these lines, even if they may not articulate it this way. Okay, I know God has forgiven me. I'm forgiven by the work of God on the cross, work of Christ on the cross. So now it's up to me to obey. This is what Christ did. And now obedience is what I have to do. So he's done his part. And this is what I have to do. And that is something that the gospel explodes and the covenant of works helps us to understand that. Because when we're talking about the Christian life, we're talking about what Paul will call in the next chapter, Romans 6, sanctification. And that is a gift of God to the sinner, no less than justification or adoption or anything else that we receive in Jesus Christ. And the life that we are pursuing and that we're experiencing as we take up the call to follow Christ in obedience to God's commands is not a life that we're earning. It is a life that Christ has purchased for us and is being applied to us by Christ through his spirit. Now, we do have things to do. We have lots of things to do in the Christian life. So we're not talking about being passive. We're not talking about uh, being quietists. We're, we're very active in the Christian life, but never for a minute do we think that anything that we do is paying God back tit for tat or doing our part now that God has done his part. You know, he's moved the ball 80 yards down the field, now we need to get it into the end zone or something like that. No, uh, the, the project of the Christian life, start to finish, is the work of grace. And again, the covenant of works helps us to see this is something that Christ, by his obedience, has won for us and is gifting to us in the here and now. And what that does, and that brings us to gratitude, that gives me the motivation to pursue the hard things in the Christian life. I think about what Christ has done for me, my ill desert, and that should provoke me to, to follow him and to do uh, all that I'm able to do by the strength of his grace to glorify him. Yeah, and towards the last half of the chapter after touching on some of these things and we'll touch on this again later on so after first corinthians 15 and romans 5 you talk about this word i'm going to assume most people don't know which is republication in the new testament and how that relates to moses and how that relates to adam and how do we see our role in the covenant of works both pre-christ and post-christ so can you define, because I don't think we've ever had a show on this, can you define what you're talking about with replica Republication and why you're talking about that in this chapter? Sure. Well, Republication covers, it's really a family of views. And it's answering the question, what's going on with the Mosaic Law? When you, when you look at the Old Testament and when you look at the way that Paul talks about the law in Galatians and Romans, it appears that the law is presented as a covenant of works. You do this and you will live. So was Israel in any sense at any level called to obey the commands of God so that they could receive life as the reward of their obedience, however we're to think about that life. That's really what the question of republication is tackling. How do we understand some of the statements that Paul makes about the law, like the law is not of faith in Galatians chapter three, or in Romans 10, when he says, the righteousness uh, which is of the law says, the righteousness which is by faith says. And he's 
he's quoting Leviticus 18.5, the one who does this shall live as the righteousness which is of works, which is of the law. Is, does Paul think that the law was a way that people were to earn justification with God? Those, those are the questions that are on the table here in these discussions. Hmm. Yeah, because it's, it's hard when you go into those passages and you're wondering, what is Paul telling us here? And I've heard a couple of different interpretations of a publication. I think some people can say, oh, that's a technical term. We don't really need that. But I think it also relates to us Christians on how do we see what Paul is saying in this? Is this does this relate to Christians? How is he understanding the Old Testament? How are Old Testament people saved? Did they have to follow the law? And so we kind of briefly describing as Paul telling the Old, the Old Testament, we can call them Christians in a sense. Um, is he telling them or is he interpreting it saying, they were saved by works, or is he saying something different than what we think is on the surface of the page? Right. Well, I think it, it's, that's just the question because the question touches on how we're going to read our Old Testaments, which proportionately is most of our Bibles. So we have a vested interest in this. Yeah. Question. yeah. Um, I think our instincts ought to say right at the start, mm, I'm not so sure we want to be saying Old Testament Christians or believers or people were saved by their obedience, partly because in, in Romans 4, Paul has pointed both to Abraham and David, mm. Abraham who lived before the law, David who lived under the law, as examples to us of people who were justified by faith in Jesus Christ and were then and there forgiven of their sins freely. So I, I think we, we instinctively say, no, that we couldn't be saying that the likes of Abraham, David, or anyone else were saved by their obedience to the law. They were justified in just the same way as you and I. That doesn't bring resolution to the question. We're moving towards that. <clears throat> But I think it does help to put some uh, some options off the table that might otherwise be on the table. Did we get a chance to touch on Galatians three? I, I didn't know if you said something about it, but that that also ties you tie that into the chapter how Paul's calling out false teachers right. in churches mm -hmm. that are echoing to pretty much uh, find salvation through fo following the Mosaic law when the Mosaic law wasn't put there for that purpose and they were they're reading into it incorrectly that's it nick um <clears throat> and i think that's the next stage of answering this question that you, you paul is not writing either galatians or romans in a vacuum um the, these are not golden tablets that came yeah. down from heaven he's writing two churches and in the case of galatia there are false teachers who are resident in Galatia who are telling the Galatians, if you're going to be justified, yeah, you, you do need to believe, but you've got to keep the law as well. Mm. And there's a whole regimen of law keeping that they're pressing on this largely Gentile congregation, including uh, calendar observance and foods and circumcision and you know the whole kit and caboodle so what paul is doing is he's not addressing the mosaic law in the abstract he's addressing it as it is being taught we would say mistaught by the judaizers in galatia and so what paul is doing is he is saying look if if you really listen to the Judaizers, then let, let me tell you where that takes you. And what he says is, if you just take the law and you strip all the promises away from it, you, you get it down to the studs, bare command, which is not the way God gave it to Israel, which is never the way he intended for Israel to, to keep the law. But if you just get down to bare law, what do you have? answer do this and you will live so so paul says in chapter five all right galatians you want to be circumcised then you better get ready to keep the whole law and by the way remember what i said in chapter three 
you can't do this. Mm. So you've got a problem with your theology. You need to rethink what God was doing with the law. And that's what Paul sets out to do in Galatians 3 and 4. What is God doing with the law? <clears throat> Answer, it was driving Israel to Jesus Christ. It was pointing them to the Messiah who was to come. That's why God gave the law. Now, the rest is all commentary on that. Mm -hmm. And Paul does something very similar in Romans. Romans, they don't have Judaizers who are active in the congregation, but <clears throat> Rome was a center of Judaism in the ancient world. So they were surrounded by Judaism. As we know from, from the Gospels, Jewish teachers were relying on the law for their righteousness and justification. And that's exactly what Paul is speaking into in the church in Rome. Again, he's, he's trying to bring gospel clarity to a situation where the law is being misread, misapplied. Paul is saying, you, you got to listen to what the law is really saying. And if you think for a minute that God gave the law for you to be righteous by it, then you better listen very clearly to what it has to say. And that's where Romans 10 comes in. He says at the end of nine, look, Israel was pursuing that righteousness by law. They never attained it. The Gentiles, they were never looking for it. And yet they found that righteousness. Why? Not because they were trying to keep the law to be righteous, but because by God's grace, they put their trust in Jesus Christ. That's the burden of Romans 9 and 10. And, and he says in 10, look, that's what the law was always designed to do. It was always designed to point to Christ and his righteousness. Yeah, it was, uh, maybe to sum it up, it was to point them, you can't do this, but somebody's coming who's going to do this for you. Mm -hmm. And put your trust in the one who's going to come, who's going to do this for you. Because if you think you can do this on your own, then you have to do everything, not just a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. yeah it's almost like stubborn piety wants to say no no no, i can do this myself yeah <laughs> i can fulfill this law myself that's stubborn piety <laughs> yeah and we all have a little stubborn pious person <laughs> yeah. locking somewhere in our hearts yeah yeah uh that, that's why these letters you know are we, we we constantly have to go back to them and hit the refresh to, to remember the big picture here. And again, this is where appreciating covenant of works, covenant mm. of grace helps to keep us from going over the rails. Yeah, and, and maybe if you can um, dive into this sentence, it's right before you talk about the theological implications. So top of 96, you say, furthermore, we observe the law, not for justification, but for sanctification, the necessary and grateful response of redeemed sinners who are redeemers. So can you build on that? Because I'm going to assume most people, when they think about the law, they don't think about sanctification. They think about, oh, this is how I fall short only in that sense. But how do Christians, how do we view the law now? Mm -hmm. Great question. So we, it, everything that you say about the law leading up is true. The law does expose our sin. It is a mirror that shows us our failings and our transgressions and it never stops doing that. Romans 7 tells us that very plainly. But that's not the only thing that the law does. We read in Paul's letters, particularly, that <clears throat> the law is the written pattern that God has given us to show us how saved people are to live in, in gratitude for what he has done for them. So we the law drives us to Christ, and then Christ sends us to the law. And when Christ sends us to the law, he's not sending us to a cursing, condemning law. He has satisfied the demands of the law so far as our standing with God is concerned. So we're on good terms with the law. We're not keeping the law to get right with God. We're keeping the law because we've been made right with God in justification. And so that puts an entirely different 
uh, hue on the way that we view the law. It, and then we can, we can enter into the way that Old Testament saints, as in Psalm 119, could look at the law with delight and relish. That's the perspective that they were bringing to it. That's the perspective that, that we have in Jesus Christ. Mm. Yeah, it's all too often, I think, all of us, not just those who are not Reformed, but all of us can look at the law and say, oh, th th these are the things I have to continually obey to be in God's good standing, even though I'm purchased by Christ, I still have to follow this because that's what I'm demanded to do versus saying, no, this is the very character and nature of God. And I, I want to follow this because I've already been redeemed by it. It's, it's an entirely different mind shift after understand, no, Christ has done the covenant for us and we can live in grateful obedience. Yeah. And yeah. Romans 8, 1, no condemnation. So we're justified. We will never fall into condemnation. And we're not keeping, trying to keep the law out of fear that, well, if I don't, or I don't do it well enough, then God is going to condemn me all over again. That issue has been settled. We're justified. And so we keep the law for entirely different reasons. We, we have to keep the law, yes, but we do so in, in gratitude, we do so in delight, and we do so in the security that our standing in Christ is immovable. Uh, we are justified and that will never change. Yeah, I feel like the law, I've, I've thought of it this way before too, is that, and I don't know if it's correct, I think it is, that it's kind of like flipping on a light switch and exposing all your sin out in the open. You know, you walk into your house, it's pitch dark, you flip on the light switch, you see all your sin everywhere. So it should be humbling. The law is supposed to humble us to, to call out for a savior. I can't do this on my own. I need a savior. And then once you get one, which is Jesus, you're incredibly humbled again. You're, and you know that, um, that he's fulfilled all those requirements for you. So it's, it's humble. It should be humbling on both sides, both calling out to a savior and then grateful that you got the Savior. Yes. And I think what you just described, Nick, is the, the transition from Romans 7 to Romans 8. I, I, Romans 7, I take to be Paul the Christian, and the law is exposing the sin that remains in his life. How does he conclude, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ no condemnation, Romans 8, 1. And then he points to the work of Christ in meeting the law's demands on our behalf. And then what does he do? He goes right into the ministry of the spirit that brings change and transformation in my life. So as, as one who is counted righteous, as one who appreciates again and again, when I see my sin, when I remember the work of Christ and I go to him for forgiveness, then I will um, present myself uh, mind and body to God uh, that that by the power of the spirit I, I can live in a way that would glorify him yeah that's good so we can we can all say in unison that the covenant works does exist in the new testament and thank the lord it does because <laughs> it was it was done for us we like that you have to earn heaven it's just it was earned for you that's right that's exactly right great well i mean if there's anything else that you wanted to add that we didn't hit under chapter Mm -hmm. Well, this has been great. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for coming on again, Dr. Waters for season three. I hope we can have you on again sometime soon. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you both. It's been a delight. Thank you. Thank you.